Okay, so I'm hoping everyone is awake and is going to remain awake for the next one hour because I'm going to be doing Banach contraction mapping theorem today. This is like a big hammer, okay? Okay, it has uh, far-reaching consequences in real analysis, functional analysis, probability, um, what else? Uh, differential equations, partial differential equations, optimization, I don't know, computer science. Uh, well, computer science seems pretty broad, but yeah, machine learning. Pretty much everything. So, pretty much everything, okay? okay? So, yep. what's the theorem? So, x is closed. T from x to x is a contraction map. Okay, and I, I had given the definition of contraction map. So T of x1 minus T of x2 is less than equal to alpha x1 minus x2 for all x1, x2 in the set x. Alpha is in 0, 1. Okay, and alpha is constant, so it doesn't depend on x1 and x2. So alpha is a constant that depends on the mapping t, and uh, it's between 0 and 1. So 0 is included, 1 is not included. And consider the iteration, so x0 in x, xk plus 1 equals t xk. So the theorem is, xk converges to x star which is a fixed point of t that is t x star equals to x star. Okay? So, the fixed point of T is a point X star such that T of X star is equal to X star itself. <laughs> yeah, the class is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so the rest of the class we are going to cover the proof and study its implication on optimization algorithms. Okay. Uh, Yes. And you said uh, that the contraction map de definition, and uh, we could change what norm it was in so long as both That's right. matching norm. That's right, yeah. So, of course, x comes with the norm. So, x inherits the norm from the original space. So, you could have Rn with L2 norm, you could have Rn with L infinity norm, you could have Rn with L1 norm, right? So, x will inherit that uh, okay. norm. And then, of course, this will have to be in the same, they have to be the same norm. So, it's whatever norm. Okay, so so how do we go about proving it? Uh, so let me first uh, let me first uh, prove that if x k converges to x star, then x star is a fixed point of t. So the first fact is, or yeah, this is one step one of the proof, or however you want to call it. Uh, so the hypothesis is if xk converges to x star, then t of x star equals to x star. Okay. And the proof of this particular fact is pretty easy, so let's get it out of the way. So we have limit, no. So x star equals to limit k goes to infinity x k plus 1 equals to limit k goes to infinity t of x k equals to t of 
x star okay so this implies t of x star equals to x star okay so uh, the thing here is that the theorem says that xk converges to x star so the convergence is part of the proof but what i'm right now proving is suppose xk converges to x star then it converges to the fixed point of t okay so all i need to prove now is that the sequence xk defined in this particular fashion converges so all of you know why this would hold because t is a continuous function okay so the reason why this inequality holds is because t is a continuous function why is it a continuous function well it's a lipschitz continuous function with a lipschitz coefficient less than 1 so therefore it's a continuous function so this equality follows from continuity of t okay any question so far okay so let's now move on to proving the fact that xk converges to x star and so for that we are going to prove that xk is a cauchy sequence yes so where is alpha uh coming from because it's it's a much stricter thing to say 4t a alpha has to be like 0.01 uh uh for that equality to hold so uh, so let me get back to this uh after towards the end of the class when i talk about optimization algorithms okay we'll 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 cover why, where alpha comes from so now the next fact is or next claim is xk is a cauchy sequence which basically means that for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists an epsilon such that uh x m minus x n is less than epsilon for every m comma n greater than equal to n epsilon okay so that's what we want to prove so let's take xm minus xn uh let me take n equals m plus k okay without loss of generality i can replace n with m plus k now this is less than equal to xn plus k minus xn plus k minus 1 plus xn plus k minus 1 minus xn plus k minus 2 plus x m plus 1 minus xm uh well this has to be m m plus k m plus k minus 1 m plus k minus 1 m plus k minus 2 and so on Okay so this follows from triangle inequality Now I can write this uh so so notice that xk plus 1 minus xk is less than equal to not less than equal to it's equal to x t of xk minus t of xk minus 1 which is less than equal to alpha 
x k minus x k minus one, which is less than equal to alpha square x k minus one minus x k minus two, and so on. So ultimately, what you get is this is less than equal to alpha raised to k x one minus x naught. Any questions on that? So I write this particular difference, which is what I want to show is less than epsilon. So I write that difference as using triangle inequality as difference of successive elements, right? Successive elements. And then I show that if you take the difference of successive elements, it's actually bounded by alpha raised to k, the difference of the first two elements of the sequence. Okay, and here I have used the fact that T has a contraction coefficient which is less than or equal to alpha. But how is it that the difference between xk and x, xk plus one and xk mm -hmm. is also less than or equal to the difference of xk minus xk plus one? What is that? Uh, but this is xk minus 1. Yeah. So what you are asking is this difference is the same as the difference of xk minus xk plus 1. Okay. So why, if we've said that tx1 minus tx2 is less than or equal to alpha x1 minus x2, mm -hmm. then why is it the case that the difference between the next elements is equal to the difference of the previous elements after it, t. It's, it's not equal to, it's... Uh, I'm, I'm saying yeah. after the transformation. So t of k minus t of k minus 1 is the exact same as yes. that difference. Yes, that's, that that's, the no, that's the definition of the sequence. Okay. The sequence comes from this particular iteration. Okay. okay. That's a good question. So remember this part. The sequence comes from the iteratively applying t to the original point x naught. OK, so all of you are comfortable with this particular claim. OK, now I'm going to use this. I'm going to plug in this particular fact back in this equation. So I have xm minus xm plus k is less than or equal to alpha raised to m plus k minus 1, x1 minus x0, alpha raised to m plus k minus 2, x1 minus x0, alpha raised to m, x1 minus x0. An upper bound, yes. No, xk doesn't converse to x naught. All I'm saying is the difference between two elements, two successive elements, is some small number alpha raised to k, which alpha is less than alpha is less than one, so alpha raised to k would be a small number, mm -hmm. multiplied by the difference in the first two elements. That's so right. So then x k plus one minus x k goes, goes to zero. Yes. Wouldn't that mean that? Unfortunately, no. So just because two successive elements, uh, the difference between them go to zero, doesn't mean that the sequence itself would converge. You need to show that it's a Cauchy sequence in Rn. Okay.
I'm trying to think of a counter example. Um, okay, here is a counter example to your particular claim. Uh, let me take xk to be summation of 1 over i, i equals 1 to k. Okay, so this goes to infinity, right? So you know this fact, right? So this goes to infinity, but if you take xk plus 1 minus xk, that goes to 0. Sk goes to infinity, right? So because xk plus 1 minus xk equals 1 over k plus 1. Right? So even though the successive uh, difference is going to zero, uh, the sequence itself is going to infinity. So it's not essentially converging. It's diverging. OK, so that's a good point. OK, so now I have this inequality. Any other question? OK, now I'm going to do the obvious, which is collect all the terms. So I have alpha raised to m. Um, I have alpha raised to k minus 1 plus 1 norm of x1 minus x0. And what is this equal to? Can someone tell me? This is a sum of geometric series, so it should be something that all of you are very comfortable with. <laughs> okay, that's not a fair assumption. Okay, yeah, one minus. One minus alpha to the. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. It's been a while since you <laughs> Yeah. No, that was tough one. Okay, so. <laughs> So what I have is, OK, uh, I need a good pen. Ah, this is good. So xk plus m minus xk, no, x, xm plus, no, xm minus xm plus k is less than equal to alpha raised to m 1 minus alpha raised to k over 1 minus alpha x1 minus x0 which is less than equal to alpha raised to m over 1 minus alpha x1 minus x0. Yes? Why is that last step necessary? I, I, I get that it's a simplification. I just want to remove the dependence on k. Okay. So remember, here I have to prove it for any mn greater than or equal to n epsilon. Right? So I want to remove the dependence on, uh, on k. Okay. Now my question is, I want to pick an appropriate value of m that would become n epsilon. I want to pick an appropriate value of m such that this is less than epsilon. So who can come up with an appropriate value of m so that this whole thing is less than epsilon for every m greater than n epsilon? OK, so let's do that. Uh, I am going to take the log on both the sides. So I have log of alpha raised to m over, let's not do over. So log of alpha raised to m is less than equal to, or less than log of epsilon over x1 minus x0 into 1 minus alpha. OK, I can take log on both the sides. Log is an increasing function, so this is fine. Then I have m log epsilon is less than 
log of epsilon 1 minus alpha over x1 minus x0. This would imply m has to be greater than 1 over log of alpha log of epsilon 1 minus alpha over x1 minus x0. And I'm going to define this as my n epsilon. Or I can just add one to it, yeah. And the uh, log of alpha uh, dividing it over switches the inequality because the log of, log alpha, of alpha is less than one. Negative. So log of alpha is less than one. Zero because oh, yes, of point. course, less than zero, yes. Okay. So basically what this proves is XK is a Cauchy sequence and by one of the results we studied in the in the early, like the, I think the second lecture, was that every Cauchy sequence in Rn converges. That's a result from real analysis that requires a proof, but we will not cover that proof in this class. Uh, but the thing to observe is since Xk is a Cauchy sequence in Rn, it converges to a point, X star. And since X is closed, X star actually lies in the set X itself. <coughs> So that completes the proof of the Banach contraction mapping theorem, okay? Yes? Sorry, can you repeat what you said about uh, the Cauchy Cauch sequence? Okay, let me erase this and I'll, I'll write it. Yeah. All of you have written this part? Okay, so I'm going to erase this part. So then the rest of the proof xk in Rn is a Cauchy sequence implies xk converges to x star in Rn. Uh, that's a result from real analysis. We haven't covered the proof, but I mentioned this result in the second lecture of uh, this class, this course. Uh, and then, since x is closed and xk is in x, implies x star is also in x. Okay. So, so far there has been no picture uh, in this class, so let me draw a picture. So, I have this set X. It could look, it could look like any random amoeba or paramecium or whatever. Okay. And you start with some X naught in the set. This is my X naught. And then I iterate it in this manner. So I have x1, x2, x3, x4. Remember that t is a map from x to x. So your points will never go out of the set x. So you will always remain within the set x. x5, x6, x7, x8, 9, 10, and so on. Okay, and you will converse to some point in the set itself, in the set capital X itself.
Okay, so why is it useful in optimization? So even though it has far-reaching applications in many other areas, um, why is it useful in optimization? Isn't it going to be because the overall result we proved about choice of M, M should tell us the number of times M's with right. the amount of error we want right. uh, before we get the actual answer. That's right, yeah. And yeah, but let's 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 go back to uh, so his point is that by looking at this error, where is this error? So this error, which is given by the contraction coefficient raised to m. So if I have uh, the knowledge of this contraction coefficient, I can run the experiments those many times. I can run the algorithm for those many iterations in order to make sure that our error is within a tolerance of epsilon. So that's certainly true. But in practical applications, it's hard to know what the contraction coefficient alpha is going to be. Okay, and that's why you don't quite know when your process is actually converging. And what you look at is only the successive difference, xm plus one minus x1. If that is small, then you terminate your algorithm. So that's what you do in practice. Because it's hard to know what the value of alpha is. But let's, let's, let's uh, defer that discussion to a later time. Uh, now I want to cover why is this result of any use in optimization? So let's say I want to minimize minimize half x transpose qx plus b transpose x, x in Rn, q is a positive definite matrix. Okay. So now, um, I give you this problem and you say, look, I'm going to use gradient descent. Okay. So gradient descent is xk plus 1 equals, gradient descent with constant step size, xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha gradient of f at xk. So that's xk minus alpha qxk plus b. And this is equal to I minus alpha Q, XK minus alpha B. Okay, so I'm going to define this as T of XK. Okay, and now I need to find the contraction coefficient of this mapping T. So let's do T of X minus T of Y is less than or equal to I minus alpha Q X plus B minus I minus alpha Q Y O oh, minus alpha B minus alpha B minus alpha B. Yes. Oh yeah, it should be equal. Because right now there is no approximation that we are taking at this time. 
Okay. So I have a function to minimize. I came up with my favorite gradient descent method with constant step size. I figured out what this map T is. I want to find the contraction coefficient of this mapping T. So I figure out the difference. Then I have I minus alpha Q X minus Y. I have a matrix multiplied by X minus Y, which is less than equal to rho of I minus alpha Q norm of X minus Y. And here I'm going to be using the two norm. Okay? So all of these are two norms. Remember that I'm free to pick the norm, okay? I am not restricted to using two norm, but in this particular case, because I have a, a, a symmetric matrix here, I am free to use the two norm. I have the, this is, this is the spectral radius. This is spectral radius. And so I have, uh, a symmetric matrix multiplied by a vector, uh, the norm two is less than equal to the spectral radius of the symmetric matrix multiplied by the two norm. Okay. Now we know from the midterm question number three that given that Q is a positive definite matrix, if alpha is in some interval, small alpha is sufficiently small then the spectral radius is strictly less than 1 right so this is equal to my contraction coefficient beta of course i'm using alpha here but i have to change the notation now because alpha is being used here as a step size so i'm going to change the notation to beta here so what i have is t of x minus t of y the two norm is less than equal to beta x minus y, the two norm, and beta is equal to the spectral radius of i minus alpha q, and alpha sufficiently small. And so what we have is this mapping, if you do the iterative mapping, which is x1 equals to t x naught x2 equals to tx1, and so on, which is what you do if you are running the gradient descent with constant step size. Then Banach contraction mapping theorem implies that xk converges to x star such that t of x star equals to x star. Oh, yes. So this, so this inequality, okay. So for any, uh, let me write it somewhere. So this is something we covered in again first or second lecture. But if you have a symmetric matrix A multiplied by a vector v, then this is less than or equal to rho of A of V, if you are taking two norm, okay? So, and this is exactly, so this is a symmetric matrix, because I is symmetric, Q is symmetric, so I minus alpha Q is symmetric. So is this actually how in, maybe not in most cases, but in a lot of cases, um, any one of these uh, optimization algorithms is proven to work? Yes, yes. So uh, we just talked about how uh, we didn't assume uh, we would know what the contraction coefficient is. is. So that must mean there is some step for most algorithms where we say this implies that there exists a contraction coefficient for an algorithm. So how does that process come about? So the, the okay, so what's the problem? So if I give you this prob so if I give you this problem in this form, then of course you know the matrix Q and there are reasonable algorithms which can tell you what the eigenvalues of Q are, and you can use that to compute the contraction coefficient and all that. Mm -hmm. 
the problem comes when I just give you minimize some complicated function fx over x and rn. Okay, then you don't know what the second derivative, what the eigenvalues of the second derivative of f is going to be mm -hmm. over the entire space, right? Um, and that basically makes it difficult for you to compute the contraction coefficient beta because beta depends on the second derivative and the alpha that you are using. But doesn't that mean that we then have to say something about uh, the code that even if we can't exactly compute the, the contraction coefficient, uh, that it has to be in the zero to one interval excluding one. Right. Uh, so how do we go about saying that for an algorithm where we can't expressly get it? Do we have another theorem or do we just say for this application we found it? Uh, no, you don't have a theorem for that. What you do is you pick alpha that is decreasing, right? So you remember that decreasing step size one over i thing. Um, or you use Armijo's rule, which automatically picks the value of alpha that is somewhat decreasing. Um, and, and that basically, at some point of time, your spectral radius will go below the threshold of 1, and you are essentially contracting after that. At some okay. point, it will go below 1 and yeah. stay below 1. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's why changing the step size or reducing the step size is kind of important in many optimization algorithms. In fact, uh, uh, those of you who might be working on the dark arts of neural network, uh, you would be doing it. So for 100,000 iterations, your alpha is constant 0.05, and then you suddenly reduce it to 0.02, and then you reduce it to 0.01. So basically, you keep reducing the, um, the step size, and you see a sudden jump in the performance, as in your objective function. The, value of the objective function suddenly reduces and then it oscillates and then you reduce the step size and then it suddenly reduces and then it oscillates so it kind of happens in many optimization routines where you update the value of alpha so at some point of time you are you are making sure that your contraction coefficient is less than 1 yes So and then you got the last step here, which is x1 equals t of x naught, x2 equals t of x1. Right. Where, where did they think that jump? So, so I started with some x naught in Rn, okay? And I applied my gradient descent method with the constant step size alpha, okay? Uh, so whenever you apply the gradient descent method, you essentially are computing x1 from x naught, and then you apply the gradient descent again, you get x2, then you apply the gradient descent again, you get x3, and so on, okay? Uh, and now the question is, is your algorithm going to converge? So Banach contraction mapping theorem says yes, you are going to converge. And in fact, the point at which you are going to converge is a fixed point of t. But then what's the fixed point of t? Okay. So, at, so when is t of x star equals to x star? So t of x star will be equal to x star minus alpha gradient f of x star. And if this is equal to x star, then this implies that gradient of f at x star is equal to 0, which again implies that your x star is actually minus q inverse b, yes, which is the optimal solution. So uh, the contraction mapping theorem uh, only gives us the uh, first order necessary condition, and that's why a uh, majority of the algorithms only give us first order. That's right. Okay. That's right. But you see the thing is the first order necessary condition is coming because of your choice of gradient descent algorithm. It has nothing to do with contraction mapping theorem. Well, All contraction mapping theorem is saying that your algorithm is going to converge. That's it. Which point it converges to is not what the contraction mapping theorem cares about. It just comp computes a fixed point of t. Now it's up to you to argue that the fixed point of t is actually an optimal solution to this problem, which is what I'm trying to do. So there, there. there can't be a stronger, like a strict no. a contraction theorem that would guarantee no. optimality? No. Okay. No. You cannot guarantee optimality with contraction mapping theorem. All you can guarantee is convergence. Okay. Now, going back to the original uh, primal dual algorithm that we were talking about, uh, I need to erase something else. So I want you to ask questions about this particular part now. 
because then I'm going to erase it. Yes? How different is this concept from uh, like a discrete control system? That Not different at all. In fact, you remember, I, I don't know if you've taken signals and systems, but when you are doing discrete time systems, uh, there is something called Bode plot, where you figure out what's the gain of the system so that your eigenvalues are within the unit circle and all that stuff, right? So you might have done it before. So all of that basically, being in a unit circle is equivalent to saying that your contraction coefficient for the system is less than one, which means that your system will be converging, it will be stable. And so your system will be stable means you will reach a fixed point where T of X star is equal to X star. And typically that point is, in the control system it's equal to zero which is your system is stable, so no matter which state you start with, you converge to zero eventually, right? So that's what this uh, guarantees. Um, so in, this, uh, yeah. in this case, we have a kind of like a linear system. Yes. Um, how, if it's a nonlinear system. In our case, it's nonlinear. Yes, so this one doesn't m make any assumptions about linearity of the map T. So it works for nonlinear systems as well, and that's part of your assignment. So, <laughs> so how do you prove that this will hold for nonlinear systems as well? So you, then you give a local result; you don't give a global result. So, okay, I don't want to get into nonlinear system, but just for your information, if you want to get global result, you use what is known as Lyapunov methods, where you prove that your trajectories are converging to a stable point. Uh, but if you want to just get the local result, then you use Banach contraction mapping theorem for nonlinear systems, okay? But global result you can only get using Lyapunov techniques, okay? Even for optimization, people are developing Lyapunov techniques now, so that's like the cutting edge of optimization right now. I just want to make sure, I think Matthew um, mentioned this, but um, your assumption uh, there's a first order next starting condition in there that the gradient map is equal to zero, that comes from our choice of gradient descent, is that correct? Yes, that comes from the choice of gradient descent, so this is, X star minus alpha gradient of FX star, that's what my gradient descent algorithm is, right? right? Um, and so if this is equal to X star, then I can cancel X star on both the sides and all I have is gradient of FX star equal to zero. Okay, okay? so it converges to a stationary point of the function F. <coughs> okay, um, any other question? Yes. So conceptually, this uh, so when we're looking at our optimization algorithms, almost this isn't uh, a way we can construct any optimization algorithms. It's a uh, outside check of correctness that's uh, using uh, this as the theorem that applies at a much much larger space than just optimization. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so wherever you have to prove convergence, so for instance, when you are solving a differential equation, you want to show that there exists a unique solution. How would you show that there exists a unique solution? You use Banach contraction mapping theorem over an appropriate closed space, okay? The space of differentiable functions. So you have to pick the setting appropriately. You have to pick the norm appropriately. You have to prove that whatever space you are using has certain properties called Banach space. And then you have a contraction coefficient, so you have to get this function correctly. And then everything else follows. The proof follows from this theorem. You had a question? Yeah, it's a silly question. Okay. So which, which came first? This theorem or, you know, pick your favorite optimization? Uh, you know, um, so Banach was a self-taught mathematician. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere around 1890s to 1920s. Okay, he was active around that time. I may be wrong with some dates, but approximately. So my feeling is that the Banach contraction mapping theorem came earlier. Okay. And then most of the optimization routines uh, were written for the discrete systems like this after 1940s. Okay. Yeah, he, he died in 1945, so okay. Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a Wikipedia <laughs> in our class. Newton's method. Uh, yeah, but Newton, okay, Newton's method was not for optimization, it was for finding zeros of polynomials, right. which, is, which can be cast as an optimization problem and then you have the same iteration, so. Um, but I think Newton's method, the proof was geometric in nature and not necessarily through a contraction thing. Yeah. I think in 1600s, a geometric proof was considered a proof. 
but I may be wrong. Okay, I don't know. I haven't read any of the literature of 1600s and 1700s. Okay. Uh, okay. So I have time. What was it that I was supposed to do? <laughs> oh yes, I remember. Yes, I remember. That's right. So primal dual method. Okay, so we start with the primal dual method where I have xk plus 1 and then lambda k plus 1 equals to xk lambda k plus alpha minus gradient of x of Lagrangian xk lambda k and h of xk. Okay, and I'm going to define this as my t of xk. So we're assuming h is a set of quality constraints? Uh, sorry, h is the? Is h a set of equality constraints? Yeah, set of equality constraints. Yes? You're losing your specification of lambda with how you've written an xk there because we don't have anything that ge generates lambda. Uh, k in this process without keeping it in memory. So you need lambda k and you need xk. So this depends on xk lambda k. This depends on xk. Yeah, what you're saying is a oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. Xk lambda k. Okay. Um, and then you want to look at so. So there is a longer proof in the book that says that t is a contraction, but I want to show you how they prove that t is a contraction. So they take the gradient of t at x star, or gradient of t at any x, that's given by uh, gradient of x, no, it's identity minus alpha second derivative of L at xk lambda k and then we have gradient of h at x k. Uh, this is the only x so let me just minus the derivative of x and 0. Okay and they call this the matrix B. And then the claim in the book is that if I look at the real part of the eigenvalue of B, okay, uh, I have to use a different notation for eigenvalue. So real part of eigenvalue of B is greater than zero. Okay, they, they, it's a pretty long proof to prove that this particular matrix has eigenvalues greater than zero. Not eigenvalues, but real part of the eigenvalue is greater than zero. And then by picking an appropriate value of alpha, you can make sure that all the eigenvalues of the gradient of t is within the unit circle. Okay, so the next claim is pick alpha sufficiently small, then I minus alpha B spectral radius is less than one. So in the case of Banach contraction mapping, your T map has to be fixed all the time. So your alpha, for the conceptual framework to prove convergence, your alpha has to be fixed. Mm -hmm. 
But in reality, when you are implementing the algorithm, you start with higher values of alpha at the beginning, and then you keep decreasing it. Okay, because this B depends on X and lambda, so we just have to um, uh, generate alpha such that for all possible values in, in the X closed set, uh, we'll get that result? Right, okay. but the, the book proves this whole result in the neighborhood of X star and lambda star because this, uh, so the thing is, the thing is for the whole space, getting an appropriate value of alpha might be difficult. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you just look at a neighborhood of X star, okay, from where it's, it's easy to get the value of alpha by looking at the neighborhood of X star. And then what you get is this closed set X is actually in the neighborhood of X star. Okay. okay that's a piece of point, but so, this is your space R n. Here is your neighborhood capital X, and here is your X star. Okay. Now, of course, you will probably start from somewhere here, and then what happens is you pick a larger value of alpha in order to get inside the set, and as soon as you get inside the set, you basically then converse to X star if your alpha is sufficiently small then. If your alpha is large, even at that time when you get inside the set, then you will diverge, and then what you get is NAN. And then you can and define uh, in the X in RN such that it's the neighborhood around. Right, right, okay. right. So that's called local convergence result because the global guarantee is very hard to give. Unless your functions are very benign, okay? So this is positive definite everywhere with eigenvalues strictly greater than zero and all that, then you can do a lot of stuff. Okay, so that completes the theorem, uh, that completes the discussion on uh, Lagrangian method, yes. What? Here? Here? No, there shouldn't be any minus because this is plus. Oh, so this is not the, so this is the second derivative of this matrix. Well, not the second derivative, but negative of the second derivative of this matrix. This one. So what we're saying, should that matrix B itself be symmetric? Because it's not correct. No, it's not going to be symmetric matrix at all. Because this is not a, uh, this is not a derivative of a function. Okay, it's not a derivative of function, so the second derivative will not be symmetric. It could be anything. Yes? I think part of it is you pulled out the negative sign there, yeah. there as opposed to what was written over there. Right, so here the negative sign, it, this is positive and negative is right here, so, yeah. Okay, so next class onwards, we are going to talk about geometric multiplier theory, and we are going to talk about duality, which are important concepts in optimization, and, uh, yeah, and then we'll study the geometric multiplier theorem. Thank you.